this is the time, right? The momentum is there. People want new things. There's a need for new things. Even billionaires want to create their own CDs. They have not necessarily created the idea, but at least there's some movement there that people want to try out new things. And therefore, I'm, I'm relatively uh, optimistic that we will see the first free CDs in the next five to 10 years. And if we have established one, two or three successfully, then it will be an avalanche from there on. I mean, you see this in Honduras, right? One, then three and 20 applications. This was already started. Este é o Tapa Talks 2023, uma realização do Tapa da Mãe Invisível em parceria com o Fórum da Liberdade, o maior evento de debate 10 da América Latina, que acontece todo ano em Porto Alegre. Bem-vindo, Paulo Fux. Olá, Júlio Santos. Neste episódio 6 da série Tapa Talks 2023, trouxemos Titus Gebel, autor do livro Free Private Cities, para discutirmos sobre cidades privadas. O episódio está em inglês, é o nosso primeiro em inglês, mas você pode acompanhar com legendas pelo YouTube. E este episódio é um oferecimento da Neugbauer. O verdadeiro chocolate vai além do paladar. E a Neugbauer, a primeira fábrica de chocolates do Brasil, entende o valor disso. Da cremosidade dos tabletes que derretem na boca, a crocância dos bibis. Passando pela experiência marcante de 1891, a Neugbauer tem um chocolate para cada momento. Conheça o portfólio em neugbauer.com.br. Noig Bauer, nossa história é chocolate. Vamos ao episódio. So, good morning, everyone. We're here with T is it Titus or Titus? Titus Gable from Free Private Cities. We're going to talk about, well, a different kind of city that is possible. And uh, my colleague Julio will read our, his resume. Titus Gebel is a German entrepreneur, lawyer, political activist, and publicist. He is the former CEO of Deutsche Hostoff AG, Hostoff, yeah? and managing director of Rain Petroleum GmbH. GmbH, I said? Yeah. It means limited. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming. Uh, take for granted this, this opportunity. Close. Okay. I think I can speak for everyone here. Uh, we are very eager to hear our thoughts on the free private cities. And first of all, I think we can... Can you describe what is a free private city? What is different of a normal city? Yeah, the main difference to a normal city is that it's run by a private company which can also be in the possession of the citizens um, but it's a private company that means it's a service provider it cannot just dictate rules um, it's a it's a private for-profit company that is protecting your life and liberty and property um, providing some infrastructure And every single resident or citizen who is coming to that city is getting a, a contract, a citizen's contract, which is clear, clearly laying out the rights and obligations of every single person. And the main advantage is that this set of rules that you have agreed upon with the city operator cannot be changed unilaterally, neither by you, nor the city operator, nor any other group or majority which gives you the protection that is lacking in traditional political systems where the rules are changed every year and normally not by you. Okay. <laughs> so it's always the other side that is changing the rules and uh, this is not satisfactory. And uh, now you replace this uh, ruler-subject relationship by a, a service provider-customer relationship. So before we're going to dive in and free private cities, I would like to know a little about a, a little bit more about you because oh. it's not it's not any person that comes to the realization that uh, the current system, political system, 
might have some deep flaws and that we need something cha uh, changed. So Titus, tell us a little bit about your past in, uh, of entrepreneurship and how you became, a li uh, do you call yourself a libertarian? Yes. So how, how you came to these ideas and what you did uh, in your industries? Yeah, it took me more than 30 years to find out that this is flawed, right? <laughs> But I think I was always a, a liberty-loving person by heart. I remember when I was 12 years old or something, and we had in history in school um, about Manchester capitalism, where people were allowed to regulate everything with each other. And I said, well, this is a good thing. But the teacher said, no, it's not a good thing. It's a bad thing because the powerful people are exploiting the poor. And I took it, right, as you say, okay, this is what the teacher is saying. It took me probably, I don't know, eight years or so to find out that this is bullshit and that a lot of people were brought out of poverty uh, uh, in the 19th century um, and 80% of the children survived that had died before. So it was back in 70s, 80s when in, in Germany, where I'm coming from, The ideas of liberty, like ideas of Ludwig von Mises, they were just not known. They were not communicated. They were not transported. And it was a time where there was no internet, right? So if you, you couldn't find out about that until there were some, from classical liberal parties, some foundations who eventually brought out that literature of Hayek and Mises. And I said, hey, this is, these, are, these are reasonable things. And then uh, for the next, I would say, 30 years, I tried, uh, became member of the uh, classical liberal party FDP in Germany, um, up to being friend of ministers and and and, and I, myself was, I would say, kind kind of establishment figure as a CEO of a uh, listed company, Deutsche Rohstoff, which I founded, mining and oil and gas company. But I found out over time that um, if you advocate for more freedom, more liberty, but also self-responsibility, there's no demand. This is just something that will, in my view, never find a majority in the political are arena because the other side can always promise everything, right? They say you're entitled to work, healthcare, education, housing, it's all for free. The state will pay for it. Um, and we take away all the risks in life that you have from you. So now if you are competing against those arguments or those slogans in the political sector, and you, the only thing you can say, I leave you alone, that means for the people, I do nothing for you, you cannot win. That's why libertarians will probably not win elections anywhere in the world. And if they do so, it is only a question of a couple of years if this will erode. Because you, have, you are constantly in the defensive. If you think I can make good out of my life, if on my own I associate with people I like, and... Just leave me alone, state, leave me alone, society. Everybody should be happy to do it their own way. Then it's a constant battle, a daily battle against all the others who say, the state has to do something. We need protection. We need help. We, there's a new initiative. Something has to be done, right? And then you have a legislative body, usually a parliament, who has to justify its existence which is by producing laws. <laughs> so they have, they have an incentive to make more and more laws, whatever the content is. And uh, that is especially true in uh, successful mass democracies of the West where they have established a free market or somehow free market system, a little bit more free again after the 1990s, now eroding again, but it made them very successful in <clears throat> It may, and I think that also applies to Brazil. The, the, the market system, what people call capitalism, which I think is a wrong term, we shouldn't use it, it's a, it's a market economy. And the market economy is so successful that one productive person can feed five others. The problem is two or three out of these five go into politics. 
right? And 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 you can you cannot provide th them a living by working hard and defending your political independence or that people leave you. It's just too much for a single person. And that is why I would say conservative and liberals are always in the defense. Every mass democracy tends to become a social welfare state to be overdebted, eventually developing into kind of a socialist system. That was my personal view and finding after being 35 years in politics up to known to ministers in the federal government of Germany, and I see how little they could do. And even despite their convictions were not so different from mine. So I said, okay, there are two possibilities. Once I could afford it, right? In, in, at the end of 2014, I could retire as a CEO of Deutsche Rohstoff, move to Monaco with my family and say, okay, now what, I, what can I do now? And I said, okay, in order... To overcome that problem, there are two possibilities. One is advocate for another 30 years that freedom and self-responsibilities are good and superior values, hoping that people will eventually understand. Doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Or taking yourself completely out of the political spectrum, create a new product, which is only a niche product for volunteers. And if it's successful, the people will see and maybe copy it. And that was new before Mises said, that's how every change and progress in the world has been established. A small group of people was deviating from the, what the, all the others were doing. And then they were doing their own thing and if they were successful, eventually the others would discover and copy it. That is how all progress in human society was ever achieved. Well, and we are at that point in history again. That's my, my, my personal conviction. I might be wrong, but I'm sure that this kind of system that you have, that we have in the Western world, is, can't be reformed. Good. Just speak a little closer to the mic. Okay. Just to understand the ideas of liberty in Germany, uh, is uh, are there 4,000 people in a place to talk about liberty like here in Germany or not? Unfortunately not. Not? No. There, um, I mean, we have a good example with Ludwig Erhard, who was also somebody who knew Ludwig von Mises. And after World War II... He said, no, we have to establish a market system uh, against the big majority even of conservative parties. And uh, he did that, which was then um, considered a German economic miracle because it worked so well. <laughs> and even the UK was overtaken. The winner of the war was overtaken by the loser of the war, right? And that was because they had the right system and was a liberal market economy. But this market economy eroded over time uh, in a degree, uh, Julio, that I would say there's still a nominal liberal party existing, which is not liberal any longer, I would say, to a large degree. And we would have difficulties in Germany with 84 million inhabitants to gather 4,000 people in favor of liberty, unfortunately. Uma pausa no nosso episódio. Quer abrir o seu negócio e tem dúvidas? Descomplique a sua vida com a DBI Contabilidade, a contabilidade que atende o TAPA há anos. Com 25 anos de experiência e mais de 300 clientes, a DBI tem uma promoção especial para ouvintes do TAPA. São quatro meses de isenção de honorários para novos clientes. Além disso, tem a isenção de honorários de abertura da sua empresa. Procure-os no contato arroba dbicontabilidade.com.br ou no Instagram, arroba dbicontabilidade e tire a sua dúvida. Voltamos ao episódio. So, uh, before we dive into the free private cities, I, I think it's very interesting that you had this political epiphany about the, the difficult that is to change the system when the system can bribe the people with their own money 
to vote against it, uh, against themselves. So, uh, don't you think that it is possible for us to have a change in this structure, the way that our uh, libertarians, uh, classical liberals are playing the game, if, for example, Bitcoin becomes successful in separating a little bit the inflation side of financing the government from the government. Because, uh, sorry, just to expand, I think that the last century, that your analysis is completely uh, perfect. I totally agree. And I think it's not, a, it's not an accident that the last century is the, last, the century that central banks rose and they, they became the weapon that uses the state uses to finance itself through inflation through time. And it's not, it's not an accident that liberals can't make people understand that they're being robbed. Yes, Bitcoin totally is making a difference, but I'm a little bit skeptical about these people running around saying Bitcoin will save us, Bitcoin will change everything. I mean, after all, it's a, it's a currency, right? And it will be, probably have its time, it's the, high, the heydays will still still ahead of us, right? But at the same time, Politics is also always a power play and will be. So if you, Bitcoin, made with, with or without Bitcoin, if you promise people that you can solve their risks in life or take away the risks they have in life, if you can, can manage their fears that they will not survive or be poor, then people will vote for you with or without Bitcoin. And... This is just how we are as, as, as human beings, right? I mean, it, I call this a minimal principle. If somebody is, we, we, have, we have, the minimal principle means that we have tried over time to use minimal effort with maximum result, which is evolutionary makes sense, right? So we have invented washing machines and, and uh, have a lot more time to do other things and to be productive or have division of labor and all that. The problem with the minimal principle if if it meets politics. Politics can promise you uh, effortless income, right? Like, okay, in my left hand, I have uh, 1,000 real and you have to work uh, two days for it. And in the other hand, I have 1,000 real and they say, just vote for me and you get it, right? I mean, what would you do? And that is, that is, um, and will, will this Minimal principle will not go away with Bitcoin. So I think um, what we really have to figure out is that we, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the genius that knows the answers to all problems. I just had the idea that with the current system, probably we will not reach our goals. And therefore I'm, I'm, I'm promoting a different approach. But if you want to remain in the in the in the current system, what you you can do a lot of things. One is advocate for sound money like Bitcoin. Then you can voting advocating decentralization, so that people have more choices. That the twenty three states or twenty seven of Brazil have more autonomy to make their own decisions. That the municipalities have more autonomy to make their own decisions. Etc. Etc. So you can do a lot. You can educate people and all this, but it, in my view, it will not solve the underlying problem that politicians can promise your money to make people happy, right? So that was why I came up with a completely different system, and I said, <laughs> actually, if we, what we believe that the market is the best mechanism to feed the people, to serve the people's needs. Why don't we transfer this idea to what I call the market of living together? So you're running, people are running around and saying, yeah, look, show me this is great and free markets are great. But at the same time, they say, no, politics has to stay as it is. We just have to vote for the right parties. That's not consistent in my view, right? If you think the market is a superior system than a top-down system, and what we have is a top-down system. We've just replaced the king by an elected president, <laughs> right? Okay, there are some checks and balances, but at the end is a group of people who are making all the rules and you have to obey. Not much different from 
past centuries. So if you believe in the market, then let's say, okay, living together is a market. Government is a service. And if you want protection of life, liberty, and property, why can't it be done by a private company? Right? It, after all, it's a service, as any other service. That, is my, that was my main idea, which brought me to that idea. That is just applying the principles that we share to an area where we didn't apply it so far. But uh, what kind of choice we're talking about? Oh. What kind of market we're talking about? I call it the market of living together, right? If So if you, normal market is, you go tomorrow, say I want uh, to paint my room. I want, I need a tax accountant, I need a lawyer with my problems with the judiciary. Okay, then you go to a tax accountant, to a painter, to a lawyer, say, what is, your, what is your hourly rate? And then you agree on a contract, either verbally or in written form. You say, okay, tax accountant, you do my tax declaration for 2022, and it will cost me whatever amount of money, right? And that is a service market, right? But now, we have, let's look, have a look into the market of living together. It works a little bit differently. Uh, and to understand how the market of living together is working, imagine you want to buy a car, and I'm the car dealer. And I say, Julio, you can buy a car from me, but it's me who decides which type, which motorization, which color, which interior, and surprise, which price. <laughs> and you have to buy. You <laughs> must buy. Right? Did you get the point? You just replaced the car dealer by the government. That is your situation towards the government. They decide what kind of services they offer, and they decide what you have to pay for it. Let's assume you are dissatisfied with the services. You are robbed, right? You paid a lot for services and police, and you are robbed. You said, government, I'm robbed three times in a month, right? I want my tax money back or part of it, right? No chance. If your tax accountant has done a bad job, you can go to court and say, hey, or can tell him, hey, look, right, I cut 20% out of the invoice. And you can go to court and you have a chance of winning. You have zero chance of winning if you go to court and say, the taxes, I, I, I'm keeping back my taxes because the government has not performed well. Because all the government-sponsored scholars have developed, I am a lawyer on myself, uh, from education, by education, have developed over the years that you don't have a, a direct uh, um, title with taxes. So the, with taxes, you are just entitled, you are just obliged to pay, but in exchange, you don't have a direct claim to certain services. That's all over the world, <laughs> the the mainstream view, right? So you have no chance. Now, if you compare these two, the normal world, civil world free markets or markets at all with your government market that is obviously a bad deal right with the car dealer it's a bad deal but nevertheless all of us are accepting that deal and trying what you are trying to do is to to try to change the offer that the car dealer is making you you say the car dealer should offer us more colors right the car dealer should offer us more colors and I say no you should choose yourself to what car dealer you go and what you are buying there because you're doing this in your in the rest of your life all the time. That is the main difference and that is, I think, the, the novelty of my idea is just transferring something that you already know to a new area. So I th that sounds very promising. I'll totally move there tomorrow. The problem is, where is it? Where are, you, where are you going to build this private city? Because, unfortunately, they do not sell territory to private cities. This is true, and I never said it's easy. <laughs> so, but look, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur by heart. I stopped being a lawyer after five years. I said, that's not for me for the rest of my life. I want to create something. 
And I created mines and I created oil production out of nothing. And, and now I want to create um, things that make it easier for people to live, make it better, make it more just because they can choose by themselves. So the first step is to develop the idea. We have discussed this now. And now you're coming just with the question, and rightly so. Okay, that's a good concept. I like it, but well, it's a concept, right? It's a theory. How do you make it happen? And now I come in place, okay, I'm going to make it happen. At least I'm trying. So how does this work? Okay, to cut a long story short, we have some elements in what's happening in the world today that are supporting our case. And one is the development of special economic zones. Special economic zones are, are existing in more than 100 countries and they're normally there for companies. They are offering companies a better set of rules that means lower taxes, lesser regulation, easier uh, administrative procedures. And this has been successful. It started in the 1960s in Ireland and it snows all over the world. And every single of those special economic zones is already a confessing of the state that obviously their rules are not the best for everyone, right? So they have already made that confession. So now I'm coming and say, look, there are over 5,000 special... I come to governments, right? And say, I have a company called Tipolis. If you want to look it up, it's tipolis.com. That is a for-profit company that wants to make this a rare. There are more than 5,000 special economic zones in the world. I, I was surprised when I heard that it's an official World Bank figure. Well, the reality is some of them are only on paper. Right? They're not really existing. You have only one in, in Brazil, right, in Manaus. But in many countries, the Dominican Republic, China, they have hundreds of special economic zones right, for each industry one. But here's the thing. If we come to go to governments and say, okay, you have established a special economic well, you, we have already more than 5,000 special economic zones with no or zero taxation. If you want to attract businesses and investors, it doesn't help you to create special economic zone number 5,102, right? Why should people go to your place? Now you have to offer more in order to also attract high potential people or qualified residents, not only companies. That is a special administrative region, which is more than a special economic zone because it also has a certain administrative and regulatory autonomy. And here's another thing. There are already special administrative regions existing. Hong Kong and Macau are officially special administrative regions. We all know that Hong Kong, Hong Kong is under attack, but it's existing. SAR are existing, which is very, very important. If you go to government and say it's already there, Right? And Hong Kong on paper has own parliament, own police, own courts, own currency. Same country, to one country, two systems. So we say, if you want to create a Hong Kong or Hong Kong, Hong Kong as it was before, let us create a special administrative region and we form an international city there. I have been told by, by diplomats, Titus, your idea with free private city is a good thing. But here's a problem. Out of those three words, two are not really liked by politicians. This is the word free and the word private. Well, true, and that's why we call it the national city. But we can also, we are also open to um, changes, right? You cannot expect that we get this model immediately. So if there is a kind of a, um, a the de democracy that is only allowing people to reject laws, you know, to come up with, with new laws. Such elements are possible, right? And we have already started to do it in Honduras, right? I mean, in Honduras, you had, to, uh, had, had the situation that there were um, a country in the grip of uh, drug gangs uh, and uh, there was corruption up to the highest courts. And there were jurists in the government saying, what can we do about it? And they came up with a solution. Let's create independent islands like Hong Kong's 
in our country. And if this is working, then more and more people can join those those cities, as they call it, zone for economic development and employment, and they can copy successful laws from other places of the world. And they made it happen. It, it was called the city law. Uh, happened in 2013. They weren't, they were not thinking about private, free private cities. That wasn't existing at that time. But they were thinking about independent systems within a system. And what happened in 2016 was that people were listening to my talks and speeches I was giving. I was writing my book between 2015 and 2018 uh, about free private cities. And they were hearing about that and tell me, we have a project in Honduras. We want to be the first city and we like your ideas. But the model of Honduras is more Hong Kong top-down model than a private governance model. Can we merge those two things somehow? And that was possible. It, I was becoming a first investor and the chief legal officer for two years to, together with other uh, um, reputable uh, lawyers work out a system where this top-down system, traditional system, was somehow amended by delegating 90% of all functions to a private company. So it's a hybrid model between a free private city and a traditional, I would say, independent autonomous region like Hong Kong, <coughs> an SAR. And that was successful because it was copied immediately. There was another city on the mainland which copied, I would say, 80% of our legal structure. The legal structure we developed was approved by the government in 2019. And in 2021, I think there were, 20, there were three cities um, approved and 20 more applications in the pipeline. And then the government changed. And a socialist president was elected, who, amongst other things, was against the cities. Uh, the main argument was Honduras is not for sale, right? But I mean, if you call this an argument, right? But the reality is that the so when they just were, were in the first year and they have already attracted several hundreds of Hondurans, right? And the Honduran is paying two hundred sixty dollar a year, so it's not for the rich only, right? So the usual thing. And, and you can see that this is really, it is a success already. And at the moment, it's also the first test. Will such a um, project uh, survive a hostile government? But the, the, uh, the Honduran jurists, they put a lot of legal protections uh, in it. For example, they said even if the law is repealed, which happened, the cities, the existing cities, are guaranteed for at least 10 years unless there's an international treaty giving a longer period of time, which is the case, because Honduras did a treaty with Kuwait guaranteeing 50 years of cities. Right? So they're 50 years now, and they're currently suing the Honduran government uh, for being so hostile uh, for damages. And we will see how this ends. Uh, maybe the government will just postpone the problem to the next government and then we can discuss again. Just to be clear, they're suing the Honduran government in Honduras? No, before international arbitration. I mean, after all, we are not idiots, okay? <laughs> and I, I, I'm a lawyer, I told you. Uh, but there were three Honduran jurists which were propagating that and they made a lot of thoughts. How can we... How can we really protect it? And I mean, this is, by the way, this is the same in all international projects. If a big company is coming to Brazil or to Germany with a power plant or a big mine, they will go for a clause that any disputes go to international arbitration, right? Not your own courts. And by the way, I took this idea and said, what about people who move into the free private city and they have a problem with me out of the residence contract. I, I'm not going to send them to my own courts. These courts or dispute resolutions are for the disputes you have with each other. If you have a dispute with me, we go to outside arbitration, which is not part of my organization. I think this is very important. And uh, this, this is what is giving 
some credibility. And the other thing is that this will not be a Google type of town where they say, by the way, we changed the contract. You can you can go anytime, right? But if you stay, you have to accept the changes. This is not attractive, right? You want to rely on the rules that you have signed. And so I cannot change that. And if there's a problem, because there will be gaps in the future, no contract can be perfect. And we go to, let me make an example. Let's assume 20, 30 years from now, you're not driving around in cars any longer. We're all flying around with drones. And there's an accident. And there's only a, a traffic rule that says, if you are coming from the right side of the crossing, uh, you have a way, right? You, the other way, the other, the, from the left has to give you way. And if the cars are crashing, the cars that are coming is come, was coming from the left has to pay the damage. But now it's happening in the air. And the guy who came from the left said, that's not applicable because this is only for roads. What do we do now? Well, we go to court and this principle, it's called case law, has been tested in British common law for hundreds of years. And it says that if there's a gap and there's no rule applicable there will, and people don't find a solution, they go to court and the court will make a decision. Let's assume the court rules. Well, it's not directly applicable, the traffic rules, but it's in a, no, a non-August way, it's applicable also in, in, in the space. That's probably the outcome, right? And from then on, this will be the law of the land. That means also over time, uh, like in British common law, the contract will deviate from the real situation. But we as an operator, we can always make different contracts with new entries, which have all these changes included. We can also maybe ha ask for a higher price if we are very attractive, but you're not going to change the maximum we have promised to you. This is very important. This and that we have outside arbitration for our problems. I think this is what I would offer the U.S. customers as goodies that you are not uh, have the impression that you're in the hand, hand of a dictator, which is just disguising as a private company and doing whatever they want, right? This is not based on property. This is based on contract, right? And, and, and you know that. It's a, it's a contract. It's a two-sided contract that cannot be changed by any group, neither by me nor by you. And here's the difference, not by majority. This is the maximum protection I came up with. And that is my offer, well, to all of you. And um, if you're interested, we have a white paper called Free Private City. It takes you 20, 20 minutes of reading. And maybe, Gustavo, can you just go around and distribute to people who are interested in it? Because I can't elaborate on all the points here. But I think if you are interested, have a look. Let's talk about uh, the theory again. Um, to a person that live it in a free private city, okay, uh, what kind of service that uh, we cannot we cannot choose today, like uh, uh, justice provider, as uh, security provider, I don't know, uh, another kind of service provided by the government today. Uh, each resident can choose. Yeah, I mean, it's just the other way around. We, we are offering you a package that you have to buy, which is very limited. Okay. It's a protection of life, liberty and property. That means you have to pay something that there is a basic security, that there is a default court system. You can agree on others, but there is one if you can't agree. Okay. There is, there is, well, there's one system. No, no, per city. a default system. Okay. That means that is the base. If you cannot agree with your counterparty to any, whatever you want, this good resolution, this is the fallback. And this fallback has to be financed, right, by us. So you pay, it's probably not much more than 1,500, 2,000 US dollar per year, right? For s basic infrastructure, for uh, a security and for um, for dispute resolution and everything else, you are free to choose as you please. For example, you want a certain type of healthcare, want a certain type of education, you want to hire your own security, you want to, you name it, right? You want to associate with other people 
to finance the war in Ukraine. You're, you're free to do that, right? But not on the expense of everybody else. You have to find your people to associate with you. And you can even say, uh, we want to establish a city council. And you get 80% of the people supporting your city council idea. And the city council then says, let's build a new swimming pool. And then you come to him when he didn't join your council movement and said, the council has decided that everybody has to pay $100 for the new swimming pool. And he's saying to yeah, but I, but I didn't agree to that council. And you said, yeah, but we are the majority. And then he's coming to me and said, Titus, they want to force me to pay for something I didn't agree to. And I said, Julio, stop that or we kick you out because of violation of your contract. Okay. So this is the difference. So, and this is the level of protection we we give you. It's relatively cheap, but on the other hand, to be fair, you still have to pay for what the state is doing here. You have to pay for uh, education, for healthcare. You have to take care of your pension. You have to take care of insurance or self-help group uh, uh, for for illness, right? And we will offer all kinds of variations. So that also there's a protection, social protection for, for workers that they have not much money. And uh, I've elaborated that in my book, how this could work. And it's, it's all not new stuff as has been tested in the 19th century, especially uh, mutual self-help groups. Um, and that means it gives you a much, much bigger choice how you want to structure your life. There's only a very limited thing that you must buy, right? Like in our car dealer example, you must buy the basic security and the basic dispute resolution and some basic infrastructure. Right? And, and you get, uh, again, a fallback uh, law, which is probably a common law system. That is the basic thing. But in any case, if you have a counterparty and you agree on a different legal system and a different re dispute resolution. I have absolutely no problem with that. It's just the, the case that you don't agree, right? What then? There's an accident. You say, let's go to the Honduran courts. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I don't want to. So what happens then, right? Then we have the fallback uh, law and the fallback court system or dispute resolution system which is mentioned in our contract and where you have by your sig signature said, I agree to that. Um, the system and uh, the relationship between the residents and the free private city. The free private city is a company or yes. is an association. A, a company, uh, whatever. Wherever. Uh, and the residents are clients or shareholders of this company. They could also be shareholders. So here's the thing. In, in the, the very basic idea is there's a private company that is, say, owned by me and you and is offering, and some investors, and is offering people who are clients, residents, citizens are clients, by contract, protection of life, liberty, and property in this framework. And they pay something for it. So they are not shareholders. They are just clients. Okay. Now, there are all kinds of variation possible. Let's assume the city operator is not performing well, right? He's doing a bad job and, 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 and it's always spending all the time, inviting all kinds of conferences and celebrities so that some of the celebrities' light is shining on him as a city operator as well. So that he's running out of money. And then he has to declare insolvency like a normal company. Now, two things can happen. A better operator is taking over or there's a citizen's buyout, right? Citizens say, okay, we are running the show. We are, we are hiring somebody. And there's also, if you want to go away from this private city terminology and be more acceptable to the left, then say, it's not a private company. It's a cooperative of all people that are living there. But here's the thing, I have no problem with that as long as you stick to the contract. Right? If you stick to the contract you have made with your residents, you shouldn't care who owns the company. It's as unimportant as who owns a cruise ship. But if you go on a cruise um, and you normally make a, make a contract with the travel agency, travel agency has contracts with the 
cruise ship company. And on the high seas, the captain, as you probably all know, at least from movies playing in the 18th century, the captain is the absolute dictator on the high seas, can do whatever he wants. You will be punished by flogging because you didn't dress up well enough for the captain's dinner. Sorry for that, cool you, but... And we are, by the way, we're, ch we're changing the route. We're not going to the Caribbean, we're going to New Zealand instead. And you would say, this is crazy, but you can't do anything about it. So you would sue the captain or the travel agency when you're back on land, right? Now, who owns the ship? It's totally meaningless. It doesn't play any role. So people think it plays a big role who owns the free privacy. That's not the case. The important question is, do they stick to the contract? And if they don't, what can I do? That is the question. So let's talk about criminals. So you, you've said, uh, I, I think I heard you say physical removal, like hoppers. What do you do yeah. with a criminal, the, the guy that murders someone? What, okay. what is? So here's the thing. Some people say, yeah, they should just be kicked out, but this is very dangerous. If the worst thing that can happen to you, if you murder some, some, somebody, that you are kicked out of the city, then you will attract a lot of people who have bad intentions and just doing this as a sport, right? So uh, I have to say that this will not be so much different from today's world. So if you commit a crime, and this is also said in the contract, we... <laughs> You will get in prison, and I, that's from my new home, Monaco. I, I, I copied some of the, I will copy some of their ideas. Is if you are a pickpocketer that's stealing just a small amount of money, some from somebody, you will end up in prison for seven days, and after that seven days, you get kicked out and never come back again. So we will have a positive selection, which will also be uh, a warning for people that. Crime does not pay out, right? But if you are a long time in the city already, then there will be a different measurement, right? You won't be kicked out because you were parking in the wrong place. Of course not, right? But um, for, for the case you made murder, prison, whatever the, the criminal code says that we have as an annex to your contract, you signed it. You signed it. Oh. And... But we, this will, if you become criminal, this is maybe the difference to the world of today. And that is coming back to what happened in the, fifth, in the Middle Ages in Europe. You were banished. And in the ancient times, you were banished. So if you become a criminal after you spend your time in prison, they cancel your contract. Because you violated the contract and you go out. What, what kind of guarantee... Um, the residents of the free private city uh, have that agreement with the free private city will be upheld. Yeah, this is a this is a good and justified question. I think the main answer is that we have an I have a commercial interest, right? Like the the cruise ship captain will not flock you and he will not change the route because of the commercial interest he and the company has. So if I misbehave, say, there's an, we have the system, I told you, the international arbitration, um, uh, Julio did something, and I said, you're not allowed to do that, and you said, yes, I'm allowed to, and he's right, and we go to international arbitration, and the arbitration said, Julio was right. You have no uh, means to, do, uh, to stop him doing his business or whatever he wants to do. And I just ignore that, because I say, I have, I have a big security behind me, right? I'm ignoring that award from the from the uh, dispute resolution authority then two things will happen one is this will make round this will make word and people new clients will not come existing clients will leave i will be sued so every property i have outside of of the city will will can be seized and i'm shooting myself on the foot because i'm out of business i will never be able to establish other free private cities so I can tell you that the competition and if the, the world was all one big free private city, we would have a problem. So that's why it's necessary to have all kinds of different models because competition is the only tested means in human history that is limiting power. 
totally agree. But let's let's dive in some some specifics. Uh, you mentioned Hong Kong, right? And once Yaron Brook came to he came to this event to to speak, and uh, we were having the lunch before the the, the main event, and I was telling him uh, about this the need for a private city, and he told me, Paulo, a long time ago I was hired by a a, a group of millionaires in the '90s to search for an island so that they could establish their own jurisdiction. And I was searching for the islands. I was going visiting places, and, and eventually they said, no, let's stop the project. And why is that? Because they said, if, if we establish a private city and we do all the things that libertarians like to do, like leave people alone, like have free banking and have things like that, the United States will come and take over. They won't leave us alone. So we need a nuke, a nuclear device, so we can protect ourselves. From, so since we can't achieve the, the possibility of having a nuke to protect us from the United States, it won't work. And I think what we're seeing in Hong Kong, it's kind of the same thing. The Hong Kong, as we were saying, was very, very uh, prosperous, very free in many senses, and China came over. And don't you think in a status world as the one that we live in, uh, these countries, they'll see this private city as a giant honeypot that they can come, take and seize? Well, I wouldn't, I, I don't think it's that black and white, right? I mean, we have, I, I, I'm aware of all these projects that have been tried out in the past, or probably not all, but, but many of them that, that are known publicly. Um, the Free Cities Foundation is investigating those things but the reality is that we have nearly 200 countries in the world and some are very small and tax-free like Monaco surrounded by high, high taxation countries how can this be well it's all about bargaining and making deals right and this is exactly how the world works it's um, in theory you're right but in practice, we also have to make compromises. That means, for example, if we set up a free private city, we would, we, we, we can say it's, it's not a free private city, it's a special administrative region, it's a special economic zone plus. And it will adapt some of the special economic law ideas. And we will won't go f further than any country in the, in the world. We would, for example, say... When it comes to offshore companies, we are doing the same as the Cayman Islands. When it comes to medical tourism, we are doing the same as whatever country. And we would be as free as it can be elsewhere. So we would not overstep in the first line. And especially when it comes to finance, right? We have to be integrated in the world banking system. Otherwise, it's impossible to make business. So we have to bend to those rules as unhappy as it makes me but this is the world of today but here's the thing i mean there are two things one is really what is on paper and the other thing is to practice and thank god we have so many countries if one country comes up with a free arbitrary way of doing things we would probably jump on that and say hey this country is doing this you have no problem with that right and yes, um, there might be a problem if you are starting a free private city in countries like China or Russia or the US. But there are a lot of other countries which are keen of getting this because they see this can make a difference to the whole country. Not so much with big countries, but with small countries, a free city that is uh, bringing new jobs and investments will make a difference. And that means it can create a win-win situation. The best protection you have is, is not the legal mechanisms that you have established with the country that you go to international arbitration if they come after you. But you say you create a win-win situation that is creating a lot of jobs for the people of this country. And that makes it very, very difficult for the government to say we are just going to tear it all down because then 10,000 people will lose their jobs and 10,000 families, and, and so on. This is 
how it worked with special economic zones. This is how it worked with the free imperial cities in the Middle Ages. They were first really fight against of the, of the monarchs of the time, of the bishops, of the monarchs, of the territorial leaders. Um, but after 100 years, that swept, that flipped around. Then suddenly the princes were saying, come into my territory, you can establish a free city here. Um, and only it's a called, what's called a free imperial city. That means only the emperor was above the city, not the prince. And uh, because they saw that these things were um, creating economic advantages also for the surrounding principality. And I think we can repeat that. And it's a long way. And maybe I will fail. But that's why I let distribute my white paper. Then you can take up from there and continue where I failed. And other people are doing the same. Other than in the 60s, 70s, we have today about... I would say half a dozen of groups that is trying to establish free cities, charter cities, special zones, you, you name it, uh, which is a good thing. And this time, this is the time, right? The momentum is there. People want new things. There's a need for new things. Even billionaires want to create their own cities. They have not necessarily free ideas, but at least there's some movement there that People want to try out new things. And therefore, I'm, I'm relatively uh, optimistic that we will see the first free cities in the next five to ten years. And if we have established one, two or three successfully, then it will be an avalanche from there on. I mean, you see this in Honduras, right? One, then three and 20 applications. This was already starting. And okay, it was now stopped by the government. Could we try again? <laughs> and then we fail and we try again. Well, I'm in this until the end of my life, right? The good thing about being a successful entrepreneur, I can afford that. I don't have to work. I can focus fully on making free cities a reality. And if I fail, people can learn from my mistakes. Next generation will do it. Or you. Good. Which kind of cities uh, from becoming a free private city or oh, not city, a place? What kind? Yeah, it's very difficult to turn around an existing city. We have seen this in the U.S. with uh, my uh, friend Oliver Porter, who is a former... Be a, a place? Yeah, it's, it's much easier if it's an uninhabited place, right? Because in, in an existing city... People are afraid that they are losing power, they are losing privileges, they are losing income. So we had the situation in the U.S. at this Sandy Springs model where you privatize everything other than police, firefighters and courts um, was leading to better quality and less cost. And one of the city operators, which were engineering companies, they offered an existing municipality guaranteed same level of services or better and 25% less cost. It was rejected by the city council, right? So just, just to give you, it's extremely difficult to change existing systems. So my recommendation, start really on an uninhabited area. That's what we did in Honduras. And all three zones in Honduras did that for a reason. So Titus, I would like to congratulate you for being a libertarian that is trying to establish the first social contract that will be signed in history. First one ever. Yes. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. Thanks all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.